<clears throat> Matthew 28, verse 1 says, In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning, and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that you seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come, see the place where the Lord lay. And go quickly. Notice these two verses. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come see the place where he lay. Prove that he's risen. And verse 7, and go quickly. Didn't say think about it. Didn't say camp out here overnight. Didn't say build a shrine. Amen? He said, he's not here. Go quickly. And tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall you see him, lo, I've told you. If you remember, even before he was crucified, he told his disciples that he would meet them in Galilee. And they departed quickly from the sepulcher with fear and great joy. Isn't it funny? You can have fear and great joy at the same time. And did run to bring his disciples' word. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, All hail. And they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. <coughs> then said Jesus unto them, Be not afraid. Go, tell my brethren that they go into Galilee, and there shall they see me. Now notice here, you get the picture, they go to the grave, the tomb, it's empty. There's an angel sitting there. The angel says, he's not here. I know who you're looking for. Now I want you to go and tell his disciples that I will meet you in Galilee, that he's going to meet you in Galilee. So the first thing they hear is he's risen. Now go. And then the first thing when they see Jesus, the first thing Jesus says is go. Isn't that right? Matthew 28, verse 16. You can drop down a bit. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Isn't that amazing? Here, everything he told them has come to pass and is coming to pass, and yet some of them were still doubting. So there's hope for us. Amen? Think about it. These, these guys weren't the cream of the crop. They weren't super spiritual people. They didn't have it all together. They were normal humans. They went through the same emotions. They had the same things going on. They had life going on. They had families. They had everything going on. And yet, they still followed Jesus. Verse 18, And Jesus came and spoke unto them, saying, Now notice, they went to see him. He shows up and says, All power, all authority is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore... Now, you ought to just go back there so far and just count how many times you see go. Right? Matter of fact, I'll make it easy for you. Go back through there and count how many times it says stay. <laughs> Amen? It's not there, is it? You don't see that till actually the closest we come is back in the book of Acts eventually and then on into the, the epistles where Paul said if you're going to live a Christian life, live it quietly, do your job, work, be good, do what you're supposed to do, work so that you can have to give to others, and he doesn't, he doesn't say don't go. He just basically doesn't emphasize going at that point. He is, he is emphasizing living the Christian life everywhere we go. Now, you understand, if all Christians lived the Christian life, nobody would have to go anywhere. Amen? Because the gospel has covered the earth. It's out there. It's all over the place. The problem is, usually Christians are the worst example the worst advertisement for it. Because we don't live what we say we believe most of the time. And for many Christians, Christianity is nothing more than a mindset. It's a point of view. It's liking this more than that. 
Most Christians never venture far from what they were raised up in. Most of them never think through their own religious preference. They were taught it as a child, and that's what they grow up into, and they never investigate anything else. They never investigate the Bible. They read the Bible through eyes that have been trained to see it a certain way, and they never question how they were taught to view the Bible. And whatever group, it, it is amazing. You hear, and it, it, the thing is, it's just the same way it was in the Bible. Because here all this stuff has happened. Jesus has been crucified and resurrected and all these things going on. And it's been several years and the gospel has been gone out. And actually, it was not the apostles that spread the gospel. It was the believers. They were the ones that spread it. Jesus told the eleven, you go into all the world. Fifteen years later, we still see them sitting in Jerusalem. Think about it. They only went out to other places after they heard revival had broke out. Well, that's what everybody does. That's what happened down in Lake, what, Lakeland. They, people hear revival broke out, and then all the named preachers want to run down there so they can get on the pulpit and be part of a historic event, which turned out to be a major fiasco. That's why if you chase after something, you usually end up getting the wrong thing. That's why you're supposed to just follow God, do what he said to do. That's one of the things that I loved about Brother Hagin. He said, all these ministers come along and they built their ministries on gifts. He said, and they're gone. He said, we built the ministry on the word of God. And that's one of the things that, you know, when people come to us, they don't, I've never had a person yet come to me and say, um, teach me how to sit and do nothing. I never hear that. I hear, you got me fired up. Now, how do I do this? And we've literally built the ministry, you might say, on showing people how to do what they already have to do in their heart, what they already know what they're supposed to be doing in their heart. So we're going to talk about that a little bit here. He says here, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Teaching them. Now, I've said this before, so this won't be a surprise to you, but notice Jesus is telling the eleven, you go, you get people saved, you baptize them, right? You baptize in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost, here is what he says. Teaching them, teaching them who? The, apost the, the eleven here are supposed to be teaching their disciples, the people they get saved, to observe, that means not just look at, but to actually obey and do all things. Doesn't say some things. Doesn't say things that you feel led to do. Because usually people feel led to do only what they want to do. But he said to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. In other words, go duplicate yourself. Right? He didn't say go tell them to make a decision. He said you go duplicate yourself. You go Find people, teach them. As we say here, we've got a kind of a four-word motto that we've started using, which is simply reach, teach, train, send. And that's exactly what Jesus was saying. You go out, you reach them, you teach them, you train them, you duplicate yourself, and you send them. He said, well, where does it say send them? He said to teach them to do all things that they were told to do. Weren't they sent? He told them to go. So if the message was the same from then till now, we should be hearing go at the same time. Isn't that right? <clears throat> several great preachers throughout history, and I don't know exactly who said it first, but I've heard several say it. Uh, <clears throat> probably came from somebody like Tozer or somebody like that. But I know I heard uh, Leonard Ravenhill say it. And I to think there were several. Well, Steve Hill, of course, said it too. But he was trained under Ravenhill, so he would. But he said... No person has a right to hear the gospel twice until everyone's heard it once. There's something in Christianity that has crept in like leaven that has infiltrated every aspect. And I'm going to compare it with some things today and, and hopefully you'll see a little clearer light. But he said to teach them, verse 20, to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world, or end of the age, as you would say. And then it says, amen, or so be it, right? So I'm giving you these examples. Now notice, 
Jesus is risen. We see it. He tells his disciples, go and meet him. He gives them the commission. Do you notice he goes straight from being raised from the dead to telling them to go? You got that? Now, obviously, we know he ascended to the Father, put the blood on the mercy seat. We know all that. We know what took place. But his interaction with humans was very simple. As soon as he gets out of the grave, the first thing he says is, now you go. Isn't that right? He didn't say, rejoice. He didn't say, celebrate. He didn't say, it's happened, boys, I told you. I told you it was coming. This is it. It's done. He didn't do any of that stuff. Now, he did stay on 40 days after that, teaching them everything out of the law and the prophets that it concerned him. And so he did continue to teach them. But here, the very first thing he says is he gets out of the grave and says, now, I've come out of the grave, now you go. Isn't that right? I know, I, I know I'm belaboring this. I'm doing that on purpose. Mark 16, verse 1. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, had brought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. And very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came under the sepulcher at the rising of the sun. And they said among themselves, who shall roll, away, who shall roll us away the stone from the door of the sepulcher? When they looked, they saw that the stone was rolled away, for it was very great. And entering into the sepulcher, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a long white garment, and they were affrighted. And he saith unto them, Be not affrighted, you seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Now, just by the way, uh, nobody can say that at Buddha's grave. Nobody can say that at Muhammad's grave. Jesus is the only one that beat death. Amen? He's the only one called Christ and Lord. Amen? And he saith unto them, Be not affrighted, you seek Jesus which was crucified. He is risen, he is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. But go your way. There it is again. You see he's not here? Now go. Don't hang around here. Don't bring flowers. Don't make this into a shrine. Don't make a pilgrimage. Amen? You understand what I'm saying? Now we, we have, we're going to Israel in September. And it's going to be awesome. We, we're looking forward to it. If you want to go with us, come and go with us. Check it out. It's on our website. It's going to be fun. We're going to do a lot over there. We're going to be teaching, ministering over there. But I want you to understand, we, we are making this trip, and we're going to be looking at some places where Jesus did some things. We're going to be doing some of the same things in the same places, but we're going back a little bit different than it was at the beginning, because now we're preaching the message that Paul preached, and we're going to do it in the same place, and we're going to have that and greater effect. Amen? Amen. Amen? But you have to realize, that, that tomb only means something because it's empty. That's right. That's right. You got that? Doesn't mean a thing if there was still a body in it. It means something because it's empty. He says here, <clears throat> the verse, where are we at here? Yeah, verse 7. But go your way. Tell his disciples... Notice that the angel didn't go tell the disciples. The angel keeps telling everybody that shows up there, you go tell the disciples. Go tell his disciples and Peter. There's a whole situation there you can go into, right? That he goes before you into Galilee. There shall you see him as he said unto you. They went out quickly and fled from the sepulcher. For they trembled and were amazed, neither said they anything to any man, for they were afraid. Now when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. And she went and told them that had been with him as they mourned and wept. Notice they were mourning and weeping. And she went and told them he was risen. And they, when they had heard that he was alive and had been seen of her, believed not. Isn't that amazing? Now, see, that's one of the things I, I love. Uh, going back to Osborne, 
he used to make a big deal. He and Daisy both made a big deal out of this verse. And he used this to actually prove the first preacher of the gospel was a woman. Amen? And it's funny because her first audience was a bunch of men that didn't even believe. Now that says something right there. He says here, verse 14, Afterward, he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. <clears throat> now imagine, they're all there eating, talking about this, hearing these things, not believing. And all of a sudden Jesus shows up. Now you know they probably jumped up excited wanted to touch him, make sure he's real. Isn't that right? We know that Thomas wasn't there originally. And Thomas told him, I'm not going to believe a thing until I can put my hand in his side and into the holes in his hands and his feet. And so then whenever Jesus shows up, Jesus even knew what he had said when he wasn't there because he says, here, put your hand right in here. So he, he knew what was going on already. And here, you can imagine they jump up, all excited to see Jesus. And the first thing Jesus starts doing is scolding them, rebuking them because of their hardness of heart, because they did not believe. Then he says, <clears throat> you've got you to picture that. He's, he's scolding them. He's upbraiding them, getting on to them, right? It wasn't the meek and mild shepherd, there, there, that's okay, boys, I understand. It wasn't that at all. You have to remember, when he resurrected, he resurrected as Lord and Christ. Amen? So he upbraided them, and, and then in verse 15, and he said unto them, Go ye, there it is again, into wherever you feel like it. This is going to all the world, doesn't it? And do what? Preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned or condemned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. And again, it ends by saying, Amen. Now, now let's get it. You've got the, the scriptural basis. How many of y'all remember a singer back in the 80s, 70s, 80s named Keith Green? Remember Keith Green? That's, his music is what I raised my family on. Him, Don Francisco, Steve Camp, some of those guys. Keith Green had a song called Asleep in the Light. And he talked about the church that has all this light and yet they're sleeping. <clears throat> and in that, there's a, a one line that he sings, one verse, I guess you call it, stanza. He says, Jesus rose from the dead and you can't even get out of bed. <clears throat> now, you are the sum total of what you surround yourself with. Christ makes you different when you get born again. If you're not different, you're not born again. It's real simple. This isn't, there's no gray area, right? You're either obedient or disobedient. You got that? <clears throat> Jesus told us exactly what to do. And he said, if you keep my commandments, then you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. He said, but if you don't, keep my commandments, and if you teach others not to keep them, then you're least in the kingdom. You know what he said? He said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not think about what I've said? Is that what he said? It's not what he said. He said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I've commanded? Is that what he said? <clears throat> A week ago or so, we brought all the staff in, and I had them watch a video. And it was called All In. And it's by a man named Mark Batterson. Mark 
Batterson. And the video is called All In. You say, why are you repeating that? Because I want you to get it. You need to watch it. You need to go through it. You need to watch it over and over again. It's very good. In it, he, made, he gave a quote that I'm paraphrasing a little bit here, but he said essentially this. The world has yet to see what God can do in and through and for and by the man completely sold out to God. You know, no one ever asked how little, well, I'm sure somebody does. No one's ever asked me how, how little they can do and still please God. They, they don't come and ask how much, how much can I sin and still be saved? For some reason, people don't come to me like that. And I'm sure some preachers hear it, but it might be because generally most, many preachers are so vague that you don't know where they stand. And, you know, with me, generally, you know pretty much what I preach. I'm pretty straightforward. I'm not vague. Matter of fact, I, I go to great lengths, even stopping in the middle of a sentence to reword something so that I'm not misunderstood and so that you get the point. And so <clears throat> we've had people ask before. I've had people tell me, man, you, you know, you, you preach me under condemnation. No, I preach you under conviction. You turn it to condemnation when you refuse to change. It's either conviction or condemnation based on how you receive it. I preach truth. I preach Bible. I quote Bible. Generally, I try not to give my opinion. If I do know I'm giving my opinion, I try to tell you, this is my opinion, this is what I think, and here's why I think it. But then I differentiate between when I'm saying, thus saith the Lord. Because you're not bound by my opinion. You are bound to the Word of God. People, Christians, want to know how to do what God has called them to do. That's what we've done. We've gone around the world and taught people, here's the truth of God and here's how to do it. We don't just say, do it. We don't just work you up into a frenzy and get you excited and go, well, okay, figure it out for yourself. We actually tell people how to do what the Bible says to do. And we get testimonies from all over the world every week of people that are doing it. And some of the most amazing testimonies are people that we've never even met. People that got a hold of our DVDs or CDs or something, MP3, something, and listened to them and just went and did it. Tremendous miracles. And now our message has literally gone into every other ministry. To varying degrees, they have grabbed hold of it, some more than others. But the thing is, with this message, if you don't go all in, if you try to preach what we say, and you try to preach another gospel, it will contradict. The Bible is true, and as long as you say what it says, you will never contradict yourself. That's why I don't try to be smart, I don't try to you know, impress you with... <laughs> eloquence or anything else. I just stand up here and read the Bible to you and say it means exactly what it says. Which means if Jesus told his disciples to go and preach the gospel to every creature, well, we can't do anything about anybody that they missed in that first century. But we can do something about the people that are in our generation. 